Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to Truth. It is a blessing and a privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter into this another new week. Come on now. Another new week that wasn't promised that this message finds you blessed and it finds you loving and it finds you growing and it finds you hungry. Some of y'all sitting up here looking at me right now, okay? But check this out. Um, I'm excited about this message this week as well as all of them. But it, it, it always in my studies and in my life and in my, um, in my walk, God has this unique way of teaching me and growing me and stretching me. And I had this, this past week, I will definitely say, has been a wonderful week for me. Amen. Amen. And um, I will share this. You ever been so hungry that you get up in the middle of the night and you run out into the kitchen looking to find something to eat, only to find what you were looking for in the kitchen did not exist? You see what I'm saying? See, then that's not hunger. Because now you're craving for something specific. Because mm -hmm. see, hunger, if it's just hunger, anything would have sufficed. Come on, right? Anything would have sufficed. Here's the piece you got to realize about a craving. You cannot crave something you have not had. Craving comes from a knowledge of experiencing it at least once. And then locking it away in your little memory bank that once again, it shows back up. Now you have specific knowledge about how it made you feel, how it tasted, how the experience was that you long for it to a degree that it will get you up out of your bed in the middle of the night, have you in your sleep clothes, driving in your car, going to the drive through window to satisfy that craving. Amen. Y'all been there. Y'all been there, right? So here's the thing. Do you know that is the way we should desire the word of God? Amen. Amen. Name me something that you've digested that's been imparted into your life better than the word of God. There's not a meal made that could come in comparison. There's not a person in your life that can come into comparison. Amen. Y'all looking at me like I'm new this morning, but we're going to lace you up like a brand new pair of shoes, okay? So now if you have your Bibles with me, with you, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at the first verse. Say amen when you have it, if not, say what on me. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at the first verse. Amen. All right. And it reads this way. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Verse 2. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Verse three. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Mighty and loving father. Once again, master, this is your poor, weak and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply to say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be used in your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hour has come where your people have got themselves together. Once again, to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power to fill me afresh and new with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, you are our master and our savior and our redeemer and we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor and the glory and it's your darling son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name, we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? And amen. This morning's sermon title is called, You Have to Be Hungry. You have to be hungry. At the top of your outline, you will find these two words, to crave. It says, to crave is an intense, reoccurring, insatiable passion for something. To long for it or strongly desire it with every fiber of one's being. Amen. Now, I just want to welcome you once again this morning. I am excited that you pressed your way to be a part of this experience. And I got to say this. God has been tremendously good, even in the midst of the challenges of life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Come on now. You know, and so this morning, Peter is talking to the church about having a real craving for the word of God. You know? 
And so because it is the craving that will lead us to be the best version of you. Everyone seen today, especially in this day and time, is always like, well, this is, I'm, this is about being the best version of me, right? If you really want the best version of you and you are Christian, then stay in this word because it will shape you and mold you into the image of his son. And if you become that, then the best version of you has arrived. Somebody needs to say something. Lord, help. You see, because genuine godliness is always marked by a love for and a delight in God's word. Jesus said this. He who is of God hears the words of God. That's John chapter 8, verse 47. And this word hears there means to obey somebody to say something. See, because we don't listen to it if that's all that it means to do. But I needed to break it down to let you know that word hears there in that portion of scripture means to obey. It means to take it and put it into practice, right? But in that same chapter of John 8, Jesus said that the true believer keeps God's words. So guess what? There's not a lot of interpretation required to understand that part, right? Paul expressed this love for and delight in the word of God when he said this in Romans chapter 7, verse 22. For in my inner being. I delight in God's law. In his inner being, I mean his innermost parts, the center of who he is, he desires and loves God's word. In Psalms 19.10, David said it this way, that the word of God is more desirable than gold. Yes, then much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the drippings of the honeycomb. Come on. Do you understand how beautifully, how, how, how he painted this excellent picture and value of who God's word is to him, that it was greater than gold, fine gold, and it was sweeter than honey, the honey in the honeycomb? Do you understand the desire and the hunger and the craving for that word? My God. You see, it is a basic characteristic of the believer to delight in the word of God. Let me ask you a question. Do these verses I just read express your heart? Amen. Is this the way you feel? Do you find your heart crying, oh, how I love your law, God, how I love your word, God? Is that how your heart sings? Is the word of God your delight more precious to you than silver, more precious to you than gold? Because, see, I want you to think about this question because it is the question that is behind the text that is before us this morning. Peter says, like a newborn baby desires milk, so should you desire the word of God. Come on now. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Y'all quiet. In a sense, he is echoing the cry of the psalmist. There is to be in the heart of every believer the love of the word of God, the love for, the delight in, the literal craving to know the word of God is Peter's theme in our text this morning. See, I'm talking about you have to be hungry. Amen. And Peter is telling us our natural response because of our salvation should be a strong desire for the word of God. See, it should be a d- dominating driving force in the life of a believer. Some of you can go day after day and week after week and seemingly show no delight and no love for and no craving to study the word of God. Wow. And as a result, this ex- exhortation from Peter becomes very, very important to us. So if your answer is no this morning, Here is my question to you. How can we develop that craving? Mm -hmm. There are five principles in our text from Peter this morning that tells us how to cultivate the craving. The first principle is found in verse 1a, and it is to remember our source of life. And when I speak of source of life, I'm talking about the source of our eternal life. The second principle is found in verse 1b, and that is to eliminate our sin. 
The third principle is found in verse 2a, and that is to admit our need. The fourth principle is found in verse 2b, and it is to pursue our growth. The fifth principle is found in verse 3, and it is to survey our blessings. Amen? Amen. And it's in verse 1a that we see what Peter has to say about remembering our source of life. Listen to what he says this. He says this, therefore, stop. And so when Peter says, therefore, he was referring back to chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, where it says this. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Verse 24, for all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. Verse 25, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. He is speaking of the seed which is imperishable. It is, the, it is by this seed that we are born again and it gives us eternal life. Somebody should say something. Y'all quiet. You see, this is the first principle that we should never forget. Peter is reminding the church that the saving power of God's word in our lives is the catalyst for ongoing commitment to scripture. Amen. Do you know your body requires, your flesh requires food to fuel it? Amen? Amen. And if you starve it, your body starts to fail. Do you realize that when you are saved and you are filled with his Holy Spirit, it requires food? And if you don't feed it, it will suffer just as well as the body. Come on. Amen. Let's make it plain this morning. And so, in our lives, Scripture is the only power that enables us to live the Christian life. Amen? Now, let's look at the second principle. It's in verse 1b, it says, eliminating our sin. He says, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. Before even mentioning the craving of the word, Peter gives the church some preliminary measures that must be taken. We must first eliminate or lay aside any and every part of our lives that could potentially be a hindrance to our desire for God's word. Somebody needs to say something, right? See, the phrase rid yourselves or lay aside, depending on your translation that you're looking at, simply means to strip off, to take away, to abolish, to do away with, to get rid of, or to remove. Amen? Amen. Amen. The same idea is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Again, this concept is found in James chapter 1, verse 21, where it says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Somebody should be saying something. You see, it is interesting to note that James places the same premium that Peter does by mentioning the elimination of the bad before receiving the good. And the good in both situations is God's word. Do you know, uh, in my younger days, I was quite the basketball player. Yes, I was. I'm going to tell you, country boy growing up with some skills. Left-handed, but could shoot left or right. I'll roll you this way or roll you that way, cross you up, put it on you. I'm going to tell you how it was. My younger brother, seven years younger than me, much more athletic than myself, much taller than myself, good kid, good skills. He would have me play all of the kids in the country. <laughs> We'd be in our backyard, basketball, daddy put a goal up, We'd been in the backyard back there, and he would have all the kids in the neighborhood come through and play me all day. Okay? 
And at the end of the day, my brother would play me. Because he figured I would be tired. He would figure that then he could beat me because he had never beaten me. And so what he realized or what he didn't realize was that he really was more skilled at this game than I was. He was better built for it. He had more athleticism than I would probably ever have in any two lifetimes, right? But what he did not have was my heart. And so for him to do that, and I know he's bringing these kids in to play me, right? But here's the thing. I would wear him out and it would upset him. Flash forward to my own children. We used to go to church and we'd play three on three basketball. And my boys, Josh and Jordan, they can, they can run the hoop with you. Okay? We used to go there, play the three of us together, killing them. Killing them. Grown men. I got two kids. Me and two kids. Killing grown men. Oh my God. It got to the point that they were like, oh look, y'all can't play together no more. You got to pick between your kids. I couldn't pick between. I said, y'all pick somebody. Because it ain't going to make a difference whether it's one of me or two of me. I'm going to still wear you out. Because you don't have my heart. But here is the thing I need for you to understand. If I showed up to play my brother in the country in my cowboy boots and my rustlers. I had rustlers before Wranglers. I'm a work in progress now. Stay with me. Right? And in my work shirt, long sleeve work shirt and so forth, I got my cowboy boots on, I got my jeans on, all this kind of stuff. If I showed up to play my brother that way, do I win? No. If I showed up to go to the, the church league to play on the three on three team in my boots and my, in my jeans and my long sleeve shirt and so forth, do I have the ability to win? No. Because see, I've hindered myself because one, I, I can't move as well in my boots and in my jeans as I can in my shorts and my sneakers. So therefore, I had to lay aside all the hindrances that would hinder my best performance. Are y'all getting this? You see, so you must put aside the things in your life that are going to hinder you from desiring God's word. You got to remove those things. Right. And so Peter specifically mentions five things that can get in the way of our passion for God's word. He said five things. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy. And slander. We're going to briefly look at those five real quick. Malice carries the meaning of hatred, cruelty and overall general wickedness. Deceit means dishonesty. It is deceiving, crafty, cunning, and misleading. Hypocrisy means two-faced or insincere. Spiritual phoniness. It's like an actor who wears a mask in an attempt for the audience to believe that he is someone who he really is not. The fourth is envy. Envy carries the idea of resenting others' prosperity. Fifth is slander. It falls under the category of gossiping. It describes someone who is seeking to defame another's character. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. By the wording used in verse one, it is clear that this elimination is another step in craving God's word. You see, it's a step that must be taken for the believer to fully crave God's word. You see, I'm talking about you have to be hungry. And so now it's in verse 2a that Peter brings our attention to the third principle, admitting to our need. It says this, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. So what does a newborn baby have to do with God's words, you might ask? Mm -hmm. The point Peter is making is this, just like a newborn baby earnestly craves milk, so the believer should earnestly crave God's word. Somebody needs to say something. You can't say you're living in me and I'm not spending time with you and I'm not feeding you, so therefore you will be strong in me. My God. The word crave means an intense, reoccurring, insatiable passion for something. See, it is that kind of desire that we should, we should have toward God's word. Question. Could a newborn baby go a day without milk? Could that same newborn baby go a week without milk? 
The answer is no. The baby's greatest need in life is milk. The cry for milk from a newborn baby is unmistakable. It is persistent, unyielding, and relentless. It is that same kind of passion and hunger that we as Christians need to have for the word of God. Somebody needs to say something. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, let me try to clarify who Peter is talking to here when he says like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word. Many would like to think he's talking about new converts. Others would like you to think that he's talking about those who remain spiritual babies in Christ. Peter is not talking about any of those. He is making an analogy. He is simply saying every believer, whether he or she is a new convert or an old convert, whether he or she is young in the faith or mature in the faith, every believer is to crave the word of God. Amen. See, I'm talking about you have to be hungry. Now, listen to me. Peter does not say read the word. Paul said that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Peter does not say study the word. Paul said that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Peter does not say meditate on the word as Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 puts it. Peter does not say teach the word as 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 commands. Peter does not say preach the word as 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 shares. Peter does not say search the word as we see illustrated by the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Peter does not even say hide the word as the psalmist does in Psalms 119 verse 11. All those things are very important. But there's something even more basic than that. Before you can read it, study it, meditate on it, teach it, preach it, search it, and hide it, you first have to what? Crave it. You have to want it. This is basic. This is foundational. And let me tell you something. Don't ever get to the place where you think you don't need it. My God. Three times the Bible says man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. These are not suggestions. We never reach that point. We spend all of our life pursuing every word that comes out of the mouth of God. See, the baby cries in its infancy because it wants milk. It needs nourishment. And the believer should have that same cry every day. Amen. My God. Amen. But so many Christians have been stuffed with junk food. That they've lost their appetite without ever being nourished. Somebody should be shouting right now. And they have no appetite for the pure spiritual milk of the word. We have so many weak Christians and so many weak churches. Spiritually malnourishment is rampant today because of junk food from the pulpits and from our own listening selections. So you can't blame it all on the preacher. See, we get to pick and choose what we put into us, the, 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 the podcast, the, the social media pieces, all this kind of stuff. We pour junk into us. See, if you ever say you're listening to something biblical and it never convicts you, but it always lines up perfectly to where you are and what you're thinking, it ain't right. It's keeping you comfortable on your way to hell. I need for y'all to hear that because see, we'll say, well, I was listening to someone so today and he said or she said and it was good and I, you know, right? But you, if you always listen to stuff and it never convicts you because see, if you're not being convicted, then you're comfortable. If you're comfortable, then you're not growing. Somebody needs to say something. Got to make it plain. I got, I, this is called committed to truth. I got to give you the truth of it. My God. Spiritual malnourishment is rampant today because of junk food and a rejection of the pure spiritual milk by the believer. It's a rejection by us, the believer. 
I said this this week. I don't know how you may feel about Patrick. Whether you like him, dislike him, think he's crazy, whatever. But what I do for God, the seed that I send out is always good. Always good. You may not like the, the sower. I may not even be good at what I do. But that seed is always premium, top shelf, always. The question I have, if the seed is good, then it's got to be the soil. Huh? Yeah. Ooh, it's hot in here. Y'all can bring your stones and go on the stone me now and get it over with. But I got to preach this word to you. You see, people of God, if this describes you this morning, I encourage you to get back in touch with your need and your hunger. Amen. We desperately need the nourishment of the word of God. Somebody should say something. Amen. See, I'm talking about you have to be hungry. Amen. But how should you read the word of God? See, we're very good at listening. Oh, I was listening to it today. Somebody else is reading it to you. So therefore, you've not given your full attention to it. Now, if you can't read it for whatever reason, then that's one thing. God will make it manifest and work with the spirit to make the work for it. But if you have your ability to hold that book in your hands mm -hmm. and to read into the between the lines of what's written there and let the spirit come in the room and prepare your heart and your mind and till the soils of your heart to receive the seed that he's about to implant in you. And you don't. Mm -hmm. If you take the easy way out. Well, I listen to Christian music all the time. Great. So how's your study? But I listen to this podcast. And I listen to that podcast. Great. How's your personal opening up of the word? How is it when you go into your secret closet and you've closed the door and it's just you and the Lord and you're at his feet? How has he been ministering to you? We like easy. Amen. Do you realize easy create difficult lives? Huh? It's the heart that makes life easy. Somebody need to say something. That when you go through the hard lessons of the truth of the word and he prunes and he purifies you and you come out of it, your world and your walk is so much easier. But when you do easy, it's ugly and it's hard. My God. So you ask yourself, how should the word be read? It should be read like a hungry baby sucking with all of its strength to draw out its nourishment of its mother's milk. That's how you should read it. That your very life hangs in the balance. Because it does. You see, if you want to develop that craving, remember your source of life is there. Eliminate your sin and admit your need for his word. See, if you're being malnourished spiritually, it's going to show up in your life. Somebody needs to say something. I'm going to say it again. If you are being spiritually malnourished, it's going to share up, show up in your life. Mm -hmm. See, I'm talking about you got to be hungry. And it's in verse 2b that Peter now highlights the fourth principle. Pursuing our spiritual growth. Listen to what he says. So that by you may grow up in your salvation. So that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Peter tells us that we need to grow. Pursuing our spiritual growth is the main issue here. See, we need to be fed because we need to what? Grow. It is always sad to see a human being who is malnourished, weak, and stunted in development. 
But it's far sadder seeing believers who are spiritually malnourished and underdeveloped. It is by that intake of the truth and the Holy Spirit grows and matures the believer. My God, did y'all get that? It is by the intake of the truth that the Holy Spirit grows and matures believers. It doesn't just say by your intake. It's by the intake of the truth of God's word. Amen. That's what grows the believer with the Holy Spirit. Because see, when you feed the truth of the word into you and the Holy Spirit is in you, it's got something to work with. Mm -hmm. My God. And it's not optional if you grow. It's a command. We're commanded to grow in our salvation for 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not optional. People always want to try to, well, it didn't really mean that. It did. It really meant all of that. Peter tells us it will grow us in respect to salvation. In other words, it will grow us to the fullness of the expression of our salvation. Somebody to say something, right? See, it will grow us literally into salvation, into its full, final, glorious expression. I must share with you. If you're content with where you are spiritually, you will never pursue growth. Amen. Amen. If you are content where you are spiritually, you will never pursue growth. But if you're discontent, you will grow. Our spiritual growth rises out of discontent. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? Amen. Our spiritual growth rises out of discontent. That's a very important principle. Spiritual growth rises out of discontent. We are to never be satisfied with where we are spiritually. Oh, my God. I'm not talking about that you're trying to add some extra super special knowledge that nobody else knows to you. It's just the truth of what's there in the book. The mind of God. The B-I-B-L-E, the basic instructions before leaving earth, that one. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you're going to go to some far reach corners of the earth and find some Tibetan tablet that's going to give you. No, I'm saying you go here to the to the, the, the King James, the new King James, the NIV, the, 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 the new American standard. You go to the ESV, you go to that place. Get you some commentary, some good commentary, by the way. And try the spirit by the spirit as you feed the spirit. Somebody should say something. Amen. And so we are to never be satisfied with where we are spiritually. Listen to what the greatest Christian that I that has ever lived said, the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14, he says this: Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now he has, I haven't gotten it yet. And I'm continuing to press on. See, I'm talking about you have to be hungry. Amen. So pursue your growth. Don't ever become content. You see, as believers, we should be motivated by the opportunity to grow strong and mature in Christ and enjoy greater blessings and usefulness. So if you're enjoying life where you are right now, do you know that the deeper you go into the Lord, the greater that enjoyment becomes? Amen. Most of us don't know that because we're not willing to go beyond where we are. So if you think you've just You've just, it's just a taste. You've just gotten a taste. There's so much more. So here's the thing. It's in verse three. Peter now reveals the fifth principle. We're getting ready to close. To craving God's word. And it is surveying our blessings. Listen to what he says. 
Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Oh, my God. You ever walked off in the kitchen and mama be cooking and so forth and said, mama, just give me a taste. Because the, the, the meal wasn't ready yet, right? But she just gave you a little taste, right? And you're like, ooh, ooh, good Lord. Oh, uh, mm, right? Because it was good, right? Amen. But you hadn't got the full meal yet. You just got the taste. But the taste gave you an example of what the real rest of the meal was going to be like, right? And so now you're sitting there rubbing your feet like this in your hands. Can't wait for the plate to be set before you because you know it's going to be greater because you just got the taste. Amen. Finally, Peter reminds the church of something they already know to be true. They've got the taste. Namely, their personal experience of God's kindness. The word taste could be as easily translated as experienced. And now the word now could just as easily be translated as sense. Mm -hmm. The same idea is found in Psalms 34 verse 8 when the psalmist says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. See, Peter's point is that we have all experienced or at least tasted the kindness of God. If nowhere else, we have all experienced his graciousness at salvation. Somebody needs to say something. Therefore, we should desire more of that goodness by continuing to feed on his word. We should regularly survey the blessings of our salvation, remembering the many times God has answered our prayers. And all the times that he has touched our lives with his kindness and mercy. Somebody should say something. So here's my question. Do you really want that craving? And if you do, then put this message into practice in your life daily. And stay hungry for the word. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for another beautiful time in your word today, God. I pray that all that was shared here was acceptable in thy sight once again, Master. This is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant, Master, just desiring to only honor you with every breath I take. I pray, Father, that for the seed that was sowed today, Father, that it fell on fertile soils of hearts and minds, Master, and that that soil had been tilled and prepared to receive such a seed. Lord, let that seed take root. Let it take deep root that when the issues of life come, it can't choke it out. When the heat of the day gets up on it, it can't burn it down. Let them water it. Let them nurture it. But most importantly, Father, let them grow it in you. God, I continue to pray for those that are struggling and suffering with sickness in their body and in their mind especially those still going through COVID. God, I pray that you would help your people get smarter and do the right things, regardless, to protect one another. And so even now, Master, as your servant prepares to leave this place, but never your sight, God, I ask that you would go before us, lead us and guide us, keep us in perfect peace until we shall come together again. And Master, we'll be forever careful to always remember, give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory and it's your darling son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name, we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? Amen. And amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Like and share. Drop me some comments. I want to know what you think. Take care. Bless you.